right, so um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today for the Woolman Seminar, um, Seth Bordenstein. Um, he's the director of the Penn State Microbiome Center, which has 500 men, members spanning the human, environmental, and agricultural uh, microbiome sciences. And he's also the Huck Endowed Professor of Microbiome Science and the Professor of Biology and, and Entomology at Penn State. Um, Seth is an evolutionary geneticist and a microbiologist studying the interactions between microbes and their animal and insect hosts. And he also focuses on some of the applications of his work to controlling um, insect vectors that carry diseases like malaria, um, which affects human health and health disparities. Um, Seth got his PhD in evolutionary genetics from the Department of Biology at the University of Rochester and worked at the MBL or the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole for many years, which is where I met him. Yes. Um, and then, uh, went on to be a professor at Vanderbilt University for many years until moving to Penn State just this summer. Um, so he, he's uh, still, I think, you know, working out some of the kinks there, but hopefully uh, it's it's warming up to you very nicely. Um, you, it, it, he also won a number of awards, including many teaching awards, like the Excellence in Education Award from the Genetics Society of America. He, he's the director of an HH, HHMI initiated science education program Discover the Microbes Within the Wolbachia Project, um, and also uh, recently a fellow of the Academy, American Academy of Microbiology. Um, and today we'll be talking about the battleground of sexual reproduction, how phage genes selectively kill anim animal embryos. So thank you again, Seth, for joining us and uh, please begin. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's really good to reconnect with you after many years. Um, and uh, a thrill to know that you know we're colleagues in in in, in biological sciences. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I am about three months into a new appointment and job here at Penn State University. Uh, we have one of the largest and most active microbiome centers in the country, and um, are offering uh, a number of unique programs, including for graduate students who can earn a dual title degree in the microbiome sciences. So. Um, if you have trainees that are interested in this field, we're doing a, a lot of stuff here. Uh, I encourage you to contact me or check out our website to learn more. And um, without further ado, I'll tell you a little bit about one side of our work on uh, animal symbionts and their promise for controlling vector-borne diseases around the world. But I'll tell you that story from a very basic science perspective. Uh, and that basic science is enabling some of the transformative vector control strategies. If there are questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand and maybe Sarah can moderate for us. Uh, so let's go ahead. Uh, so as an undergraduate student, I was first exposed to this uh, global symbiont success story uh, called Wolbachia. And Wolbachia was sort of a, a love of entomologists in the 1980s and 90s as PCR technology was just getting started because uh, entomologists who had studied their bugs for decades suddenly realized their life just wasn't about insects. It was also their insect lives were about these bacteria inside them. And in fact, the origin of this bacterial uh, uh, discovery was really in 1920s when uh, Dr. Wolbach and his student uh, Marshall Hertig in Harvard found these rickettsia rod-shaped bacteria in the reproductive systems of various insects such as mosquitoes. And they were ripping open these uh, mosquitoes and tissues and looking under a microscope and finding what they thought was odd at the time, right? That there were bacteria living inside the reproductive tissues. This was not a, an expected phenomena, but yet given the handful of insects they looked at, they made this prophetic statement that these bacteria may be more common than just what they had surveyed at Harvard at the time. And so when you march forward to the PCR technology and where the field grew up from in the, in the 1990s and 2000s, we now know that Wolbachia occurs in 50% of the world's arthropod species. And I want you to sit back and take this in for a second because 85% of all animal species are arthropods and half of them have Wolbachia. So if you start extrapolating numbers, we're talking about millions and millions and millions of animals slash arthropod species that harbor a single genus of bacteria called Wolbachia. 
Now, COVID gets a lot of attention for being the, the current pandemic, but from a global biodiversity perspective, Wolbachia is not just a symbiont success story, but really a global pandemic across the arthropod biome. And I'll tell you why that is and why they're useful to us as well. So if we look inside some of our favorite insects, we study Drosophila and we also study these parasitic wasps called Nisonia. You're gonna see some mating behavior in this video here where the male is chasing the female to mate and ultimately court. Uh, here's a prettier picture on the right. And why they're called jewel wasps is that this metallic green sheen and golden legs and antennae, and they're about two millimeters in size, really tiny. And now if we ripped open the reproductive tissues, we would also see these Wolbachia bacteria. Very simple, uninteresting organisms to look at really through the transmission electron microscope, with the exception that there are multiple membranes around this bacteria. Those are Golgi-derived membranes that the Wolbachia essentially cloak themselves in to live inside the cytoplasm of their host cells particularly in the reproductive tissues. So if you to stain for fluorescence uh, signal, you could find Wolbachia predominantly in the reproductive tissues. So red in the testes here, and then orange in the ovarial of the ovaries here. They do occur in the somatic cells as well, just not as high a density as they do in the reproductive tissues. And one of the main reasons they live in the reproductive tissues is because they are maternally inherited bacteria, much like mitochondria and many other symbionts are, they're maternally inherited. So this is a developing wasp embryo early in embryogenesis, and you can see the mitotically dividing uh, DAPI stain DNA in blue here from the wasp. But you can also see the large cocktail of Wolbachia bacteria that have been inherited from the, essentially the oocytes in the ovaries now into this developing embryo. And what's brilliant about these green Wolbachia bacteria here is they are polarized towards the left end, the posterior end of the embryo. That becomes eventually the reproductive tissue cells of the adult. So magically as early in development, they kind of know where they want to be in order to set up shop for being in the testes and ovaries in the, in the, in the adult uh, life stages. Brilliant uh, sort of strategy. Now, in our case, we have been fascinated by the fact that we can pair deeper into the symbiosis than Hertig and Wolbach did. Um, so Michelle Marshall, who is a technician with us at the Marine Biological Laboratory, early on took some great pictures and found that Wolbachia bacteria have these bacteriophage or virus particles inside of them. You can imagine these particles actually leaving the Wolbachia membrane about right here and busting through in this act of lysis because the cell membrane is about here and is about here and then it wraps around. Um, here's a Wolbachia cell that's granular in structure. It's about one micron in size, no, no phage or viral activity, but just above it, we have phage particles. We have a collapsed inner membrane that's falling in and we have a pycnotic DNA patch. Presumably this is degraded DNA that stains very densely. This is also the act of canonical phage lysis for free living bacteria now seen in this endosymbiont. A bit of an oddity at the time because uh, viruses were not, or phages were not known to be common in endosymbionts. They were thought to be rather streamlined organisms that just lacked a lot of mobile genetic elements. Not the case for Wolbachia. Uh, and then here are these phage particles that appear to be extracellular floating around, in this case, the testes matrix. And maybe they're seeking out new Wolbachia cells to infect. Um, what's right beside them is the sperm tail, just a cross section right through the sperm tail here. Okay, um, one of the big reasons that Wolbachia are famous today and well known among um, entomology, medical biology, it's not just a curiosity anymore, is its applications to controlling dengue and Zika virus. So across the world in these sites, the World Mosquito Program has been very successful in releasing Wolbachia infected mosquitoes to control vector-borne diseases. Um, let's just take the example of Australia where this program started. Over time, each one of these black marks indicates a locally acquired dengue case when there was no alteration to the population there. But when the scientists started releasing Wolbachia infected mosquitoes in green, suddenly you can see these tick marks go way down and essentially there's been no or to almost no transmission in dengue from mosquitoes to 
uh, to, to human hosts. Now across the world, they see about 60 to 90% reductions in locally acquired dengue cases because Wolbachia somehow inhibit the replication of dengue as well as Zika virus. And therefore, if you can transform the populations locally, you can reduce transmission from mosquitoes to humans. And that's exactly what the World Mosquito Program is doing and has done for the last decade or so. Um, so these are kind of the crashing, pop, uh, crashing numbers of reduced locally acquired dengue cases uh, uh, over a number of countries, across a number of countries. Um, this is essentially the program in a nutshell. So they put Drosophila melanogaster wolbachia into a mosquito, the Aedes aegypti mosquito that transmits Zika and dengue, and then you have a high reduction in transmission. Uh, you can release these green transfected Wolbachia mosquitoes into a population that's uninfected. And over time, that replaces the uninfected population. It goes to fixation. And voila, you now have a Wolbachia infected population that can no longer or that severely reduces Zika and dengue virus replication and transmission. What a wonderful uh, outcome of basic science to kind of change the world for positive outcomes here. Wolbachia also contribute to arthropod speciation. So here's a case that we established in, gra in my graduate school days, a um, number of sympatric and allopatric parasitic wasp species of Nisonia, and they can't interbreed because of what Wolbachia does to their reproductive biology. But when we pull the Wolbachia out by antibiotically curing them, all four species can suddenly interbreed in a, in a renewed viability state. And I'll tell you why both these things are happening, both the speciation and the vector control in just a second. There's a number of other cases that have come online that implicate Wolbachia in driving these fundamental evolutionary scenarios. Here's the reason that underpins some of the success of what Wolbachia has done to the vector control program and its impacts on evolution. It's called cytoplasmic incompatibility. That's a bit of a mouthful, but it stands for CI for short, or we call it CI for short. Um, this Punnett square, you're going to see repeatedly in the talk. So just follow along. If you get it now, everything else seems easy. I'll keep showing this uh, along the way as a reminder. Um, the key cross is this colored in infected male crossed to an uninfected female yields a CI cross where the embryos die early in development. However, um, if an infected male mates to an infected female, now those embryos are fine. They're essentially rescued or nullified from the CI and the infected offspring develop quite normally and, and uh, with normal numbers. The uninfected males are compatible with both uninfected females and infected females. So CI here is a one-way crossing incompatibility, and its mission is essentially to reduce the fitness of uninfected females. And by doing so, infected females have a twofold fitness advantage, reproductive advantage. Twice as many offspring in the next generation are infected relative to the uninfected. And that's why Wolbachia spreads for vector control programs. And this is also in part why uh, populations of hosts or species of hosts can be isolated from each other because the Wolbachia prevent hybrids from forming, let's say, between infected and uninfected populations. Now, the death itself is um, a paternally delivered embryonic lethality. So something in the father delivers this CI death in the embryo. Uh, the first error we see is in the first mitosis. So uh, after fertilization, you have the chromatin dividing. This is a normal cross. This is a CI cross. There's aneuploidy and shredding paternal chromatin here that's abnormal and can lead to embryonic death. Sometimes, though, the embryos will somehow survive this phenomenon, and instead we'll see into one and a half hours of development in a CI embryo, missing areas of mitosis. This embryo is also going to die, arrest early in development. But from the beginning, we see cascades of paternally delivered chromatin errors here. So the biggest question in our field for many decades then has been, getting to the genetic basis of what makes Wolbachia so interesting from basic and applied science. And that's what we focused on as an evolutionary genetics lab um, about 10 years ago now. So the way we approached this was with an unbiased screen. Uh, my partner in life and science, Sarah, and an MD PhD student at the time, Jason, got together and did a comparative multi-omic analysis. 
And to make a long story short, by looking at essentially strains that cause this phenomena and strains that do not cause it, as well as transcripts and proteins, in the middle of the Venn diagram here are going to be the candidates that specifically and, and strongly then associate with CI. And these candidates remarkably boil down to two genes, which we've called CIF-A and CIF-B. Now, for anybody that does a multiomic analysis, to end up with two genes means you're either dead wrong or you're dead right, because normally these comparative multiomic analyses yield hundreds of genes. We really didn't quite believe it when we saw it, but we also realized we had to test it as well. This also lined up with some predictions in the literature that suggested these two genes may be important to CI among what was sort of 20 to 30 genes out there that were candidates. So it provided a little bit of um, uh, validation that we were sniffing up the right, uh, the right track, if you will. So where are these genes? Well, this goes back to the virus and the phage now, because these two genes are inside the prophage, the inserted phage genome of Wolbachia. We call that phage, phage woe. And that woe phage has a module of genes that are predicted to be either eukaryotic derived or to interact with eukaryotes. Think about it for a second. A phage that has genes, in fact, half of its genome that looks to be armed with genes that it will uh, interact with the arthropod or acquired from the arthropod itself. CIF A and CIF B are enigmatic origin, have enigmatic origins. We do not necessarily know where they came from. Um, but if you make a phylogeny of them and they are so rapidly evolving, that's why it's hard to know where they came from, at least within Wolbachia, they have mirror phylogenetic images of each other uh, into these major groups or divergence groups. So these are co-evolving genes, or at least co-diverging genes that are adjacent to each other, suggesting that they may have some correlated function with each other. Now, the phage itself also, uh, Rupinder has shown in a nice review on Wolbachia, if anybody's interested in this sort of story and phenomena, that the phage specifically associates with the phylogenetic groups of Wolbachia, which we give letter names, um, that are known to be parasites of reproduction. So group F, B, A, S, and E are all known to be parasites of reproduction as Wolbachia bacteria, and they also have this phage well. Whereas the ones that are mutualistic in green or have agnostic, we just don't know the phenotypes in gray, those don't, aren't known to have phages. So there was also a good correlation with the phage here as well. So with these candidates in mind, the question became, well, how do you test this? Because it's not an E. coli bacteria that you can simply knock out the genes. It's an endosymbiont. It's obligate intracellular. So it has to live inside the host and we can't culture it outside the host. So the way we approached this genetic and functional question was to engineer those genes into the fly genome, the Drosophila genome, and in the absence of Wolbachia, express them to see if we can recapitulate the phenotype. And we use that with the well-known GAL4 UAS system of Drosophila. So we use a testes promoter to express the gene specifically in the testes because it's a paternally delivered lethality problem. That drives GAL4 and then Oh, and then GAL4 will bind to an upstream activating sequence, which will then launch the transgene. And in this case, it's CIF-A and CIF-B. So the CIFs are now expressed in the testes, and we're asking the question, in the absence of Wolbachia, can we just get the gene to recapitulate CI? It seems like a pretty big ask. But if we're right, the comparative omics is right, this is what we should expect to see. So CIF-AB male, transgenic male, causes CI with an uninfected female. And then that same transgenic male crossed to an infected female should also produce normal numbers of offspring because the Wolbachia infection can rescue its own modification in the male, right? So this is, uh, this is sort of the big cross for us. We wanted to see if these, this cross and this cross come together. So here's the team of graduate students and undergraduates that perform this work. Um, this is the color coding we use for the data. And in a wild type uh, Drosophila melanogaster system, you're gonna see that embryonic hatch rates are quite reduced in the CI cross. So that means embryos that hatch into larvae are at a very low, uh, a very low percentage here. The embryos are mostly dying, but not completely. That's very normal for CI in the Drosophila system. When we ex transgenically express CIF-A, what you can see is very high hatch rates. So it's not recapitulating CI in any capacity. This would essentially be equal to an uninfected by uninfected cross. These embryos are hatching into larvae. So is the single CIF-B. But lo and behold, when we combine them together, we can now recapitulate 
embryonic death, and it's extremely penetrant, um, perhaps because the transgenic system is so potent and powerful. Uh, in fact, we estimate that uh, orders of magnitude higher expression of these genes in the transgenic system relative to the wild type Wolbachia system. So that correlates nicely. Most powerfully, when we cross these same males to the infected female, we do achieve this rescue phenomena. And so a transgenically expressed protein from phages in flies is recognized by the bacteria in the embryos in order for it to nullify this paternal chromatin problem. And now the embryos are viable again, normal hatch rates. So this was really good. It suggested we were very much on the right track. To kind of uh, polish this off even further, we imagine that with the transgenic system and with the variable amounts of CI that occur in a wild type male, we might be able to dial up CI or dial it down. Uh, in this case, we're dialing it up by combining transgenics and the wild type uh, Wolbachia infected male together. So remember, here's kind of the variation we see in a wild type Melanogaster Wolbachia cross, right? CI is quite variable, but still reduced from those high levels. Now, if you do this combination where you put in CIF A plus the Wolbachia infected males, you can increase the amount of CI, lower the hatch rates. You can do the same for CIF B at about the same rate. And then when you combine both of them together, you can push the system even further. So in the sense of dialing it up, we can turn up the, the juice, if you will, and deliver this paternal effect lethality on top of the wild type um, CI and increase it. Um, these are the defects that I had mentioned that occur in CI crosses from a cytological perspective. So uh, in a normal cross, paternal chromatin and maternal chromatin divide equally, and you get beautifully mitotically dividing uh, insect embryos. But for a CI cross, you see this kind of mess. The paternal chromatin are sort of aberrantly dividing. They're stuck at this metaphase plate, and that leads to a, a dead embryo. And then sometimes we see these anomalies where the embryo gets past the first division. It arrests early in development. It also can show this kind of paternal aneuploidy chromatin bridging phenomena even later in development. So we think some of this shredding of the genomes continues to happen even later in development. And these are very much recapitulated in our transgenic CI crosses, validating that what we see at the phenotype level, at the organismal level, is also under the hood occurring at the cytological chromatin level. So at this point, we felt pretty good that the CIF genes were resolved as the cytoplasmic incompatibility factors. And the bigger question then became, what's the other half of this? Because something expressed in the females ultimately can lead to rescue of the embryos, right? That's our premise here, that in these crosses, there's a factor that nullifies the CI. And that could happen in the ovaries. It could also happen in the embryos, um, where Wolbachia are maternally inherited and rescue that, that paternal chromatin problem. We didn't have a lot to go with. So the Venn diagram suggested you got two genes that should explain the whole phenomena. So perhaps one of the rescue genes was the same as the CI genes. And we set out to test that. And so Dylan, a uh, former graduate student in the lab and incoming professor at Lehigh University now, um, created a, a model that was born out in genetics and function called the two by one model, where CIF A and CIF B cause the CI and CIF A expressed in the female rescues the CI. Here's the data for that. So uh, uninfected transgenic male with the AB causes the CI. This is rescued by the infected female. Notice that the wild type male here with Wolbachia crossed to a CIF A female produces rescue as well. That was a key cross. And then here's the whole system synthetically engineered in the flies with these two phage genes on the male, one phage gene on the female side, and we can recapitulate the CI and the rescue completely with phage genes in an animal reproductive system. So that completed the circle now of a very simple genetic toolkit that it has deep ramifications for vector control success, as well as fundamentals of evolutionary phenomena in the wild. Um, but Dylan went on with Mahip to kind of dissect the uh, essential regions of the CIF-A and CIF-B proteins that are required for CI. So we did evolution-guided mutagenesis, meaning that these were sites with the triangles here that were 100% conserved across all CIF-A 
alleles and CIF-B alleles. We mutated them and we, we put in uh, different residues and asked, does the residue switch essentially ablate the phenotype? Uh, here are some of the annotations. Uh, we have a nuclear localization signal. We have a domain of unknown function. We have a transcription factor here. This is a nuclease domain, nuclease domain, and then a ULP or deubiquitinase domain here. Let's see what they found in summary without going through all the data. So on the CIF-A side, you, if you mutate these front half of the protein, you can ablate rescue. So we deem them sites essential for rescue. In addition, those same sites plus deeper into the protein are essential for, CIF, uh, for CIF-A's ability to contribute to CI. This is a result I particularly appreciated because it showed that different sites within the protein, as well as some of the same sites within the protein, can guide the phenotype of CI or rescue. CIF-A plays both sides of the equation, and it's nice to see the genetic confirmation of that in this system. On the other hand, everything about CIF-B, whenever you swap it, whenever you swap those amino acids, you can ablate CI. So this is the CIF-B protein that's only on the CI side of the problem, and indeed, it doesn't matter where we hit it. Uh, we're going to cause a problem in ablate CI. So probably the protein structure is altered to some degree in this uh, set of analyses, and the protein maybe unfolds a little bit and can no longer uh, cause CI. Okay, so with the genetics and some of the evolution resolved, we now turn to uh, the, the what we think is the next big problem in the field, which is what's the mechanism? How does uh, a set of simple prophage proteins work on animal gametes in order to deliver this embryonic lethality. So speaking of gametes, this is uh, the testes of Drosophila, beautifully stained, that shows kind of stages of spermatogenesis that begin here and essentially end with sperm tails and sperm heads by about right here. Uh, we believe that within the developmental window of spermatogenesis, from germline stem cells all the way up to mature sperm, that these proteins are wielding some kind of biochemical and enzymatic action on the genome itself. Uh, that's the question. So where are the CIF proteins? Where are they during spermatogenesis? And what's the paternal genome modification that may underpin the embryonic lethality? Uh, two postdocs, Brittany Lay, now in industry at LifeSci and current research professor uh, Rapinder Kaur, took on this role of developing antibodies and visualizing where these proteins are. So a CIF-A antibody and a CIF-B antibody. Remember, CIF-A has a nuclear localization sequence, so that's a clue to what we might expect to see. Along this early part of development, from essentially the germline tip to the round onion spermatids, in green, you'll see CIF-A nuclear localized, and in red, you'll see also CIF-B nuclear localized along development. This is, this, this, this is good to see. It makes sense that these proteins are manipulating the chromatin in some way. We don't know explicitly how yet, but at least they're localized to the nucleus. Moreover, at the canoe stage spermatids, so right here, when you start to see kind of what you think about as a sperm, you can see the proteins at the tips where the nuclear material is. It may not be on the nuclear material. It's kind of hard to discern. It may be around it at the, at the tip of the head, the acrosomal tip, or it may be on the DNA itself where there's some overlap. Um, at the needle stage spermatids, where they become individualized, kind of stripped of cytoplasmic material surrounding them, we actually failed to detect them. This caused some concern because we suddenly wondered where are the proteins? But in fact, there's a good reason. These are very densely packed DNA um, and these sperm are so densely tight and wound up that the proteins don't get in. But if you decondense them a bit um, with a simple chemical method, you can then expose them to the antibodies and suddenly we can recover where these CIF proteins are. So we see again, CIF-B at the tip. Now it really does look like it's around the head rather than on the DNA here. And in, interestingly in CIF-A, it's um, no longer associated with the head per se, maybe in a rare case here, but it's also widely distributed on the sperm tails um, of, these, of these individualized sperms. So it seems like CIF-A's localization has shifted to some degree, though still some locate at the head. Okay, so we have these mutants that can ablate CI. So that's in fact what we looked at next. We looked at the mutants that can ablate CI and asked, 
well, does this disrupt the localization of these CIF proteins? And indeed they do. So what was once nuclear localized for CIF-A is now cytoplasmically localized when we use the mutations in the nuclear localization sequence. And clearly that localization that is essential for function, reaffirming the, the nuclear modifications are gonna be very important to the phenomena here. Okay, so when we think about what causes the actual modifications, there's a classic window in spermatogenesis known as the histone to protamine transition. So this is conserved from flies to humans. During early development, histones will wrap up the DNA. And during late development, smaller proteins will wind up the DNA even tighter. And that's why we get these really refined sperm heads. It's a fundamental process that ultimately transitions in the canoe stage. Uh, and that's what we looked at initially. So we used a general histone antibody to look at the canoe stage and ask, are there abundance differences? And immediately you can see this beaming signal of histones retained in purple on the wild type Wolbachia from W from Drosophila monogaster, as well as the transgenic system. Both these cause CI, the absent uninfected um, uh, flies do not have histone retention. So it's clear that the histones are modified or at least retained here in a way that is going to maybe contribute to the problem. Um, here's that quantified now uh, with a gradient of effect, as you can see between the uh, MEL plus is a little bit weaker than the transgenic system. We expected that because the transgenic system is expressed a lot stronger and the uninfected uh, do not have histone retention. Okay, so if the histones are retained, then it's a very simple hypothesis that the protamines are sort of going to be absent. And we went ahead and looked at that. Now there's a stain in the mature sperm. It's actually a nucleotide stain in which they bind to sites that normally protamines bind to. It's called the CMA3 stain. And so if the stain is weak, that indicates that the stain is unable to bind to the sperm head DNA and there are protamines there. So it's an inverse relationship. But in the CI sperm, you see this beaming uh, green stain, and that's because it can hit the DNA. The protamines are not there anymore. So we consider these protamine deficient with the higher stain. And once again, we can quantify that problem and show that the CI sperm have higher rates of protamine deficiency than the sperm that do not cause CI. To see if any of this was potentially causal to the CI itself, we took advantage of some Drosophila mutants that have deletions in the protamine, uh, uh, protamine proteins, and therefore they're going to be uh, defective protamine uh, flies. And we denote that with the delta prot, so they have deletions in the protamine genes. And then we also have the minus or plus symbol for whether they're uninfected with Wolbachia or infected, uninfected or infected. This kind of gives you a sense of the arrows of where the protamine deficiency levels are. You can also see the statistics up top. But as we expect, the uninfected fly has kind of the lowest amount of, of protamine, uh, or actually has the most amount of protamines than the mutants or the infected uh, CI sperm. So this is what we see for CI, right? The Wolbachia infected versions can cause CI. The Wolbachia uninfected versions of these can't. And if you put this all together, what you end up showing is that the wild type sperm, which have a protamine deficiency, cause this variable level of CI. But the same wild type sperm now with the protamine mutant, so less protamines are going to be there, therefore they're protamine deficient. Ultimately, that causes a slightly stronger level of CI than the wild type, right? And they have a slightly higher amount of um, protamine deficiency. So we think this evidence suggests that the protamine or the chromatin integrity itself is actually causal to the CI phenomena, linking you know, the CIF phenomena to this histone and protamine transition and the, uh, some of the acute cause of the incompatibility. Okay, to kind of bring it all together, insects around the world have Wolbachia. They also have, half of them have uh, uh, the Wolbachia infection, and then virtually all of them have prophage regions. In this case, we're looking at the Drosophila melanogaster. They have this module with the CIF-A and CIF-B genes that make these proteins. Um, these proteins are in early development. They're nuclear localized in spermatogenesis. They are uh, localized at the tip of the sperm and the genomes are modified by histone retention and protamine deficiency. Uh, the mature sperm somewhat changed the dynamics where it tends to be that the CIF-A protein is scattered throughout the tail 
and it tends to be the CIFB remains at the at the end of the head end of the sperm. So, okay, the big, uh, I think, functional question next for us, which I can't answer yet, we don't have that data, but we really want to know what's going on on the female side with these problems. So if the histones are retained on the paternal genome, but not on the maternal genome, is that what creates this kind of aneuploidy chromatin, chromatin catastrophe? And so you have sort of an asynchronized um, processing of the chromatin that results in this, in this embryonic death. But when the Wolbachia infects the embryo, it could also perhaps, and this is a hypothesis, reciprocally modify the maternal chromatin, once again, syncing up the genome for mitosis to go normally. So where they're asynced in mitosis because of chromatin alter alterations and differences, here they become synced once again. Okay, um, I got a little more time to tell you what is uh, a short story on a second smart weapon of Wolbachia, another tool in the toolkit to enhance their maternal transmission to the next generation. And this is a simpler one. It's exactly what it sounds like. Male embryos that are infected will be killed by Wolbachia. Female embryos that are infected are not killed. The uninfected embryos are obviously un unaffected. And you might ask yourself, well, what's in it for the flies or the hosts, um, or sorry, what's in it for the Wolbachia, that it would preferentially kill male embryos with Wolbachia, but not female embryos. There's no explicit fitness benefit just like this. But when resources are limited, and this has been shown in experimental population cages, competition is reduced if the, if the males are dead. The females get to feed on those limited resources. So they grow fitter, they grow fatter, they lay more offspring than the uninfected population in which those females are competing with their brothers, and therefore they consume less resources. So this is a resource reallocation model that enables a fitness benefit to the infected females, experimentally validated in the lab. The downstream consequences of this for biology are quite fascinating because if a male killer symbiont is effective, it could essentially crash the population, right? Because no males are left and the females have nobody to mate with. But at intermediate stages, that can switch dynamics such as mating behavior. So in these butterflies where lek mating normally occurs, that's group mating, um, the males will group up and the females get to choose who they want to mate with. But when the males are rare, uh, guess who groups up? It's the females that group up and then the males get to choose who they want to mate with because they're the rare sex. So fundamentals of Wolbachia biology translate into these kind of dramatic changes in, in biology and behavior of, of lek mating in this example. Uh, to make a long story short, we found a candidate gene that was born out of our original analysis. Um, and in this analysis, essentially we find this gene called WMK or WO-mediated killing. It's a hop, skip, and jump away from the SIF genes in this eukaryotic association module. Um, it is associated with uh, male killing strains, although in Melanogaster, um, this is a strain that's not known to cause male killing, only CI, but it does have this WMK gene. But otherwise, these genomes are about 99.9% .9 genetically identical, so very similar with the capacity to cause male killing. These are some low uh, E values, but the WMK is predicted to be a transcriptional regulator or at least a DNA binding protein, because it has these helix, predicted helix turn helix domains um, that are often, two of them are often uh, uh, diagnostic of a transcriptional regulator. Okay, so graduate student at the time, uh, now postdoc at the University of Kansas, Jesse decided to recapitulate male killing, but to do it transgenically. So here she expresses the proteins in male and female embryos. And lo and behold, she can selectively kill male embryos at an intermediate rate. So this isn't an all or nothing phenomenon like the CI. Here we have our control gene in which these dots represent fly families and the sex ratios average out to about one male to one female. But in WMK expressing uh, lines, we have about a 60% sex ratio. So that means 40% of the males have died. And it's not full, but it's certainly suggestive of a single gene major effect on the male killing. And in fact, the males are the ones that are preferentially killed because 40% of the embryos show these chromatin defects, much like the same ones we saw in the CI crosses. 
and we could diagnose the embryos with a Y chromosome fluorescent marker and then type them for their chromatin to see where the problems are, which, which sex has the problems, it's the males, and then what kinds of problems will they look a lot like those CI embryos. Okay, so a question then that naturally comes is how does a symbiont or even a phage gene cue in on males specifically? And the simple answer is it comes back to sex determination or what's known as the dosage compensation complex pathway in flies. And dosage compensation is used in flies and many other animals to upregulate X chromosome gene expression to equilibrate it with the two X chromosomes in female. So it's a compensation tool to increase gene expression on the X chromosome, and it's very male uh, specific or heavy express. So in the WMK expressing line, we've stained for DAPI DNA. We've stained for a DNA damage marker, which is a histone marker that indicates DNA damage. You can see it's enhanced here where the DNA is, and it's enhanced in the males, interestingly enough. And we've also expressed a histone marker of the dosage compensation complex. Um, this is an acetylation marker used in the dosage compensation complex activity process. And as you can see, it's expressed in both the WMK line and the transgene control transgene line in which there's no male killing. That's what we expect because this is uh, normally a fly process. But what matters most here is the overlap between the dosage compensation complex and the DNA damage. And if we quantify that, you can see that the puncti for DNA damage and histone acetylation involved in dosage compensation complex is markedly above baseline controls or the female sex, indicating, suggestively at least, that the dosage compensation complex has gone awry. This is linked in or associated with DNA damage. And then those males specifically die because of the dosage compensation complex altered activity. Um, there's an exquisite sort of co-evolutionary feedback loop between the WMK gene and its host because we expressed this melanogaster version, we've expressed versions that are close related to the melanogaster version, and then we've expressed versions that are distantly related from very different Wolbachian host systems. And so as we increase genetic distance when expressed relative to the melanogaster variant in melanogaster, we change the phenotypes quite considerably from male killing to everything killing to no killing. Um, this suggests there must be some sort of co-adaptation that occurs between a candidate male killing gene and its host background. And that's that probably makes sense from a, a, a dramatic phenotype like male killing where it's queuing in on a sex specific pathway of that host. It's as if it's gone awry here and everything dies and it's as if here it can't recognize its target anymore the WMK gene variant is just too divergent. Okay, um, final point on male killing is uh, along the same abstract discoveries that we've made, it turns out that we've made different transgenic variants and sometimes we've made ones with synonymous site changes and it correlates with whether the WMK gene can cause death or not cause death. Uh, uh, the short story here is that a silent site chain in the transgenic male killing can turn off male killing, uh, which suggests that silent sites are much more functional than we've appreciated. Um, so here's the WMK normal variants that we express. They cause this sex ratio bias, so there's less males, about 40% of them have died. And here's two of the variants where we expressed a silent site change relative to the normal WML uh, uh, codon. Um, one of them actually has a non-silent change, and then one of them is just a silent change. So TCG against TCC is a silent site change here. And then this one above it has both a silent and non-silent change. That codon is clearly important because whenever we change it, we can get no killing. And it's clearly important because the silent site itself is sufficient for ablation of the killing. This is not due to what we thought of as a gene expression difference. Maybe by altering the codons and the nucleotides, we were affecting the level of transcription and therefore we would not get killing. That's not the case. So gene expression is equal. We are now wondering if RNA structure is altered to the ability that transcription to translation is altered. And therefore the protein isn't made as much if it has these altered secondary structures in the RNA. Some of the modeling we've done has borne that out, that the silent site changes can change the RNA structure, raising the profile of a life or death situation on a silent site change. 
Okay, so to kind of put this story together, we think that Wolbachia, at least for the male killing protein, well, that male killing protein that is secreted, it targets um, the dosage compensation complex or this male specific complex, alters it in a way that maybe changes gene expression of the dosage compensation complex, eliciting DNA damage, and ultimately chromatin alterations that lead the embryo to death. Definitely a lot more to work out there. Okay, big picture summary then. So uh, a great pandemic originally discovered as an oddity um, essentially boils down to three genes, these two SIF genes and WMK gene, inside a symbionts prophage in a narrow region of that prophage that is highly enriched for eukaryotic interaction genes. Um, so we tend to think about phages as the vectors of free-living virulence genes. In some ways, you can think that this phage is very much operating in that same space, but for an endosymbiont. And it may even be souped up. It may even be superpowered with the whole eukaryotic association module driving a lot of biology with the eukaryotes yet to be discovered. Um, these are the programs that are using essentially these genes, especially the CI genes, which are used in mosquito control programs. Um, I mentioned the World Mosquito Program. Of course, when they release Wolbachia, they're relying on these two genes and their functions. There's a company in Kentucky um, that can release mosquitoes in 24 states in the United States. In fact, you, if you live in one of those states, can buy a cardboard canister of mosquitoes that are supplied throughout the year in order to control your own mosquito uh, population in your backyard. So for the cost of what would be a normal insecticide treatment year round, you can buy Wolbachia infected mosquitoes. And then Google is in, uh, it has a spinoff company called Verily. They have vans that have automated window releases of mosquitoes that go around the world and doing control methods as well, based on the cytoplasmic incompatibility system. So this world is transforming. Sometimes we don't even know, to, know that it is with uh, engineered symbionts or genes that the symbionts carry um, that are changing the world of mosquitoes and probably other vectors of agriculture or pests of agriculture uh, in the near term future. As I mentioned, for the basic scientists, the really fundamental phenomena like lek mating and speciation are altered um, by these genes as well. So how important is all this? Well, when you zoom into the window of the matriarchal doll here of an animal endosymbiont that's transmitted maternally and then it's phage, the things that sort of stand out to me in this really intimate, isolated niche is a lot of phenomena parallel what we think are happening in the free living world. Right, these phages probably found Wolbachia um, because Wolbachia is so common. They expose themselves to selfish genetic elements, phage being one of them. And because of that, you then have this sort of long-term evolutionary story of the phage affecting the evolution of the symbiont. The phages lyse the bacteria so they can reduce the densities. Therefore, they can reduce the symbiotic phenotypes, lower the penetrance of these phenomena if they lyse the bacteria. The phages are hot spots of evolutionary change in the genomes of these endosymbionts. They hold these key adaptation genes and they are responsible for some of the largest horizontal transfers between endosymbionts in the same cell. I'll illustrate that through this uh, intracellular arena model. So imagine insects in your basement or outside your house, one out of two of them, let's say, has Wolbachia, and inside of them are co-infections of Wolbachia. Well, the phages love that. So the phages could make a living in this arena by hopping between different strains of Wolbachia. And then other facultative intracellular bacteria come into that cell or come out of that cell, bestowing new genetic elements, potentially, or genes, all of which could mix up. And finally, and sometimes we see this, there can be genes from the phage that actually transfer between the nucleus and the Wolbachia themselves. So I really view the cell as an ecological arena as much as I do things outside of the cell and the organism for these endosymbionts. Okay, um, for those that love science education, my partner and I are involved in a project worldwide um, that Sarah mentioned. And if you're interested, we have a website that allows high schools and intro to biology college classrooms to do some of the fundamentals of molecular biology, but by making discoveries of how common Wolbachia are inside local insects and then through sequencing labs as well. And here are some high school students doing that. I don't have a ton of time, so I'll skip right over that. 
We have a database where students can publish their pictures and their protocols and their results. And finally, I'll just leave with some conclusions as a reminder of what we've shown today, that this really simple toolkit from phages allow the selfish manipulations of animal reproduction, the global spread of the symbiont, and then the control of vector-borne disease worldwide. So collaborators abound. Um, we are recruiting. If anybody likes this or uh, our students are interested in looking at graduate school for the upcoming cycle, and then our funding agencies are here. Thank you. Uh, I'll pause and see if we've got any time for questions. Great. Yay. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, really amazing how, you know, the, uh, you know, I'd seen you, you guys working on these endosymbionts um, in the Warnergren lab way back at the MBL. Yeah. Lori has just developed so much since then. So it's really cool to see that Every transformation. So, um, yeah, we have a tradition where we start off by allowing the students to ask questions first. Um, so I'll open the floor to students or postdocs um, who might have any questions. You can go ahead and speak up, uh, unmute yourself and speak up, or you can put a question in the chat. Yeah, hi, Jess. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I have a little question. Yeah, go for it. OK, yeah, I'm not very familiar with this field, but um, I have a question that how does the Wolfokia uh, to transmit between the mosqu mosquitoes? It's a transmission of the contact or other ways. Uh, so how do they switch between hosts? Is, is that yeah, the question? Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Um, it's one of these things where clearly all of the phylogenetic evidence suggests that they can move between different insect hosts. Because when you make a host phylogeny, and compare it to a Wolbachia phylogeny, they are just not the same thing. So they, there's lots of horizontal transmission. Um, putative cases suggest that there could be predator prey exchanges. So an uninfected insect eats an infected insect, and then yeah. somehow the Wolbachia migrate or find their way from the digestive system to the reproductive tissues. There is evidence where in certain types of insects, they experience siblicide, and they were able to show that uninfected siblings can, can acquire Wolbachia by eating their infected siblings. This is stuff that happens in the insect world. It's kind of kind of wild, but they can show that uh, molecularly that that's happening. Um, there's another case where in flies, if you inject Wolbachia into the abdomen of the flies, it'll migrate in the hemolymph for about two to three weeks until it finds the germline stem cell niche of the ovaries and colonize the germline stem cell niche and become vertically inherited. So there are these opportunities in phylogenetic evidence, but we don't really know naturally how this happens. Um, you know, is there an extracellular stage, for example? Is there a spore stage of Wolbachia that hasn't been discovered? Um, uh, that's about as far as we can take it right now. I think it's ripe for investigation. Where did the mosquitoes get it from? Well, in the case of these release programs, they injected it from melanogaster directly into the embryos of the mosquitoes. And after about 10,000 injections, one of them was successful and that established this line. So it's quite a big feat to get that to work. Yeah, so how to find the only one successful one? Just use the microscope? It was a lot of graduate student labor from what I hear. <laughs> yeah, I see. Um, but yeah, they find it. Um, so they, they, first of all, the embryos have to be viable after the injection, then they develop and ultimately lay offspring and they can screen the offspring for whether there was a successful infection and then maternal inheritance from the parent to the offspring. And so a subset of the offspring gets screened, the rest get bred. And once you find that line, that's the eureka moment. And uh, that line gets maintained as the founding population. Oh, I see. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Appreciate it. Yep. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, there's a question in the chat. Um, how do you extract DNA from insects? Uh, do we need to decipher them at the beginning, just like we need to centrifuge bacteria before extracting DNA? So I guess maybe yeah, uh, yeah separating the, the bacteria DNA from the insect DNA. Yeah, let me get my talk back up because it'll be useful. All right. 
Yeah, so we this is what we do in our lab. This is the beauty of this education series is we teach them how to do this. Um, and this is how we do it in our lab. So we, we use Kaijin DNA extraction kits with a, essentially a pestle and a tube. They'll take the whole insect, or if it's a really big insect, like a spider that's super big, we'll take the abdomen off with a razor blade and then macerate up the fly or the abdomen of the spider, uh, basically till we see things macerated. You could take it to extreme levels and use bead beading and all that. It's actually not necessary. It's really easy to squeeze open these hard shell abdomens and then the soft tissue comes out. You squeeze that a little bit more, that breaks open the cells. And then with some simple enzymes that are used in all the DNA extraction kits um, and, and soaps and things like that, you can wash open and lyse the cells and extract the DNA. And with that, you can then do PCR and gel electrophoresis. Um, you can do a fancy kaijin kit. You could also just use a simple Kelex extraction kit where you simply put Kelex and the insect together without any additional enzymes. You macerate up the insect, the DNA floats to the top of that Kelex solution and you can use that for PCR. So it can be quite simple to get this. This is what makes it very amenable for students uh, across the world as well that run this lab series. Yeah, so I think it sounds like uh, you have all the insect and the bacteria DNA mixed together, and then the specific PCR helps you pull out the insect information that you want from that. So Exactly. Yep. Yep. Uh, so uh, we can barcode the insect with a ribosomal uh, protein or the ribosomal gene itself, and we can barcode the Wolbachia with various genes. Yeah, great. Uh, looks like Marsha has a question. Marsha, go ahead. Um, thank you for just a really cool, amazing talk. Thank you. I don't really have a question, but I have sort of a comment. And that is that I think this work all in total is an amazing example of why we should continue to fund <laughs> very basic work. And, yes. You know, nature and evolutionary biology, because it can be applied. I could not agree with you more. You know, to humans. And this is like a very elegant uh, example of that. So thank, thank you for you that, Marge. I really, and... you're speaking to the choir here. Oh, right? yes, I know. <laughs> um, in a way that, no, it, you're right. It needs to be said because Wolbachia was a basic science organism 30 years yeah. ago. And today okay. it's now controlling diseases in a way that I think will earn a Nobel Prize if it's successful. Yeah. So in a very quick amount of time, We've gone from NSF funded science to NIH panels seeing a lot of this work now. Yeah. Yeah. My, it's it's my right for one is, of these um, Golden Goose Awards. Have you heard of yes, them? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My husband is an infectious disease, parasitic disease person. So I kind of know this story and the beauty of it. But this is the kind of thing we need to show to congressmen and others to, to convince them that we still need to fund this type of work. Absolutely. It, it does lend itself uh, to human disease. So thank you for that. If only we can explain cytoplasmic incompatibility to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be a challenge. But yes. They don't indeed. have to know. They just have to know we made this finding in that's these right. organisms that's allowing us to, you know, treat and cure malaria. So. That's right. A bad bacteria is good for us, right? Because we right. can use it to take care of the insects. Yeah. Exactly. So. Awesome. Thank you. That was awesome. Great. Wow. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, if you don't mind, I have one more question. Um, I, so I mentioned something to my husband about this, you know, um, you know, how you could release these, uh, you know, infected insects and they can take over the population. Of course, he was skeptical, you yeah. know, because you know, are we releasing something that might be then doing some more harm? Um, but could you use like a natural strain already? Because it sounds like there's plenty of stuff out there. So it's not necessarily that it has to be genetically manipulated or even maybe, you know, it just, it, it would have been found in there somewhere, but just not at a high enough level. And so if you increase it to a high enough level, then it will just take over in the population. So um, is that generally true or is, are these really like genetically modified. Um, yeah, I think actually this, you just outlined the scenarios that I was going to sort of describe both, you can go both ways. So in the case of Aedes aegypti, the Asian tiger mosquito that transmits Zika and dengue, they are naturally uninfected from Wolbachia. So there has to be that transinfection movement. 
And they use melanogaster initially because melanogaster was found in flies to cause RNA virus resistance. So the presumption was let's transfer that phenotype into mosquitoes and have it as a disease control agent. Lucky for them, it worked out. In the case of um, Anopheles gambii that transmits malaria, um, there is nascent evidence that they may naturally harbor Wolbachia, but at difficult to detect levels, just as you were describing. So if it was possible to amp up Wolbachia there, maybe you could recover a phenotype that blocks malaria, plasmodium, and re-engineer that system to be useful at, in its current state. Um, the way that the World Mosquito Program and the companies get around this sort of fear of genetic or really trans-infection mo modifications is quite reasonable, at least in my mind, which is Wolbachia is already in half of the world's arthropod species. Okay. So they've, they've been there and they will be there for the future. They may have been in these insect hosts 20,000 years ago or a million years ago. So we're not modifying the world in any fundamental way uh, in that regard. Perhaps the, the unknown scary thing, which there's zero evidence for, would be that if the viruses evolve resistance to the pathogen blocking ability of Wolbachia, then you might evolve a select, you might generate a selective pressure that evolves a super dengue virus or a super Zika virus that will surpass Wolbachia and other blocking abilities of the mosquitoes. And then you made the problem worse. Um, there's zero evidence for that. And I liken it to antibiotic resistance. You know, the question would be now knowing that there's antibiotic resistance, would we have stopped using antibiotics 20 years ago? And I think the answer would be no, we'd still be using antibiotics as much as we are even today. And that's just what we create when we do medicine. Um, and so those, those are kind of the range of thoughts that people have, and maybe the counter arguments to where we are with them. But how do you feel? Do you, do you think those are sufficiently justified arguments or would you counter any of those? No, I mean, I, that's what I was thinking as well when I saw, you know, 50% of insects are already infected anyway. So yeah, it seems like a, a low bar to introduce, you know, this particular strain with this, uh, you know, with Wolbachia that maybe didn't have it or wasn't strong enough to block, you know, malaria or something. So yeah, uh, yeah. The real alarmist like could say, wait a minute, you're not genetically engineering, you're genome engineering, you're putting in a whole genome new to this, you know, Anopheles or 80s mosquito, right? And you can go both ways with this. You can say, well, that's normal because that's happening all the time. Or you could say that's really abnormal. That's a genetic modification on steroids. Mm -hmm. um, depends if maybe you're an ecologist or an evolutionary biologist, because the ecologist might say that's all normal. It's happening. And the evolutionary biologist might say that's a lot of new genetic material. Um, but they monitor the mosquitoes. They've done so for the last decade. There's been very little evolutionary change in the Wolbachia, as well as the mosquito genomes. The virus resistance remains as strong as it used to be. Um, and I think they're tuned into if there was a change, you know, they've got alternative strategies to help. One of which could be using the genes we've discovered to make them stronger at what they benefit from doing, right? So if a CI strain became really weak in the field, we may be able to genetically engineer and improve that with, by putting in the CI genes, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Well, any other questions? Well, thanks so much, everybody, for listening, and I appreciate your attention and questions. Yeah. Um, Thank you again for uh, coming uh, in per or in virtually, not in person, obviously. Yes. Um, maybe sometime we 